Hi, my name is Alexandra and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome to A Lovely Jaunt where we read better, not more. Today I'm talking about this novel, The Manning Tree Witches by A.K. Blakemore. Now this novel I believe was published in 2018. Let's just double check. Copyright 2021. Okay, published in 2021 and um, I picked it up this year uh, with some of my Christmas money and gift cards and stuff like that and really, really enjoyed it. And I thought it would be a great opportunity to kind of talk about witch hunt narratives. This is a puritanical witch hunt story set in England. So let's get into the details, a little bit of a summary, get into some analysis of these types of narratives and how it's implemented in this story, what I think it does really well. As a Warning, as with much of my content, it will be spoiler filled. This is because I like to get into details of analysis. I like to get into the details of a story. This is not a review. This is an analytical video. So if you do not want to get spoiled by this book, it's a fairly new book. Totally understand, but go ahead and click away from this video. Okay, The Manning Tree Witches by A.K. Blakemore. It is set in England in 1643. So this is not a Salem witch trial, not set in Salem, Massachusetts. This is happening in England, which there were witch trials happening earlier in England and then through the same period as in Salem, Massachusetts in the United States. It was kind of a interesting historical period. And it's kind of during the height of the puritanical influence in England's politics. Like I mentioned, this is a witch hunt narrative. And one of my favorite things about this book is actually the prose is really, really beautiful. It's not often that I read books that contain words that I don't know. I flatter myself, but I think I have a pretty large vocabulary. But this book used maybe three or four words that I didn't know before that are new words that for me to learn. So I really enjoyed that. You know, just very beautiful nature writing, a lot of internal reflection on the uh, part of our main character, whose name is Rebecca West, and a very thoughtful book, a very th interesting and thoughtful and beautifully written book. Rebecca West is a young girl, we're not exactly told her age, but maybe mid to late teens. She's accused of witchcraft along with her mom and a few other women in her community, which is Manning Tree. John Eads is a young man who lives in her community and is her love interest. He's a bit of a scholar, and so she actually takes uh, tutorials from him in literacy and things like that and religion. And so they have a little bit of a love story going on in the background of this sort of. There's there's romance between them. I wouldn't necessarily call it a love story. And then the other major character that we should be aware of is Matthew Hopkins. His name is, or his nickname is the witch finder. So he's the one who sort of like finds these witches and accuses women. And he's a real historical figure. Now, some interesting history that I learned from a documentary that I watched is actually in 1597, King James himself wrote a book called Demonology, and it was basically this attempt to actually quell a bunch of the witch hunt stuff that he, this was like very, very early on in his reign at to England, so very, very early on he kind of like realized this was a social and political problem that people were, it was creating a lot of unrest and issues in society. And so he wrote a book called Demonology, which was from his perspective, according to this documentary, trying to like tamp down some of the chaos and panic and things like that that were happening around witch hunts. And unfortunately, like he gave it credence, as is often the case when we try to deal with things like this by like in a rational manner and like sort of cons by, by highlighting it, you highlight it, you know what I mean? And so it kind of ended up having the opposite effect of lending legitimacy to it because it was coming from the king and he wrote in this very sort of logical, straightforward manner about these issues. And so it kind of added fuel to the flame. Moving on from some of the historical context, I wanna talk about how witch hunt narratives work. Oh, actually, before I get into that, 
other historical context that I think is important is that there's also like wars going on both in England and in the colonies that are there's violence and conflict in the background of these stories and so in England it's called King William's War and it's a war between England and France and so the French and English colonies also get into a conflict at this time. If you ever listen to the podcast Unobscured Season 1 is all about the Salem witch trials in the United States and it goes into the, some of the historical context that was happening for the colonies as well and some of the historians really brought to light how, you know, PTSD from some of the violent scenes that they may have witnessed as a result of this conflict could be behind some of the reactions that people had, some of the dreams that they were having, or some of the trauma that they were experiencing got sort of articulated through this religious lens, and, and maybe that was behind some of the panic that is the witch hunt. Okay, so back to witch hunt narratives. Witch hunt narratives are, it's very interesting to see sort of in a modern context how we understand these stories. And a lot of times we use them as a vessel for talking about feminism. And we are able to look at the history and use a feminist lens to explain some of what was going on and the persecution of these very vulnerable women in their societies. When it gets adapted to fi fictional stories, you kind of have to balance it with the supernatural elements elements. And depending on how the supernatural elements are included in the framework, it may result in undercutting the feminist message. So, you know, from the pure, like, enjoyment, you know, side of things or the entertainment side of things, I think it's really fun to include the possibility that something supernatural is in fact going on. And actually, in one of my American Lit classes that I took way back in college, one of the analyses that was made of the one of the big differences between like horror literature in America versus England is that American literature has a tendency to very squarely like return us back to the rational and real world and very squarely try to provide some sort of um, rational understanding of the spooky and scary things that happened in the story. Oh, the voices you heard was actually the way that, you know, the water made sounds in, in, the, in the pipes or the wind went down the hallway or, you know, whatever the case may be. They, uh, it oftentimes tries to explain it back into reality, whereas British literature tends to be much more comfortable with leaving sort of a question mark in the air of like, well, maybe, maybe something supernatural happened. And so really one of the first questions that you're going to have to ask yourself as a writer is in your framework, it, are the supernatural elements here or not? Are they true or are they not? Are the supernatural elements going to be uh, supported by the framework of the story or the, the lens of the story. And there are a couple of ways that you can do this, which is like, no, these are innocent women who are not real witches and they're just being blamed for un unfortunate circumstances in a time of strife and difficulty. Or the question is, yes, they are in fact real witches. And then the question is, well, how are we framing these witches? Are they in fact pe women who are in league with the devil and they are in fact putting a blight on your cow and a blight on your crops and pricking you in the middle of the night? Are they agents of evil and chaos in this world? Or a lot of times you see witches kind of framed as like the community healers. And even then that could be a question of like, oh, they're the community healers, no supernatural. Oh yes, they're the community healers. They are supernatural, but they're forces for good and they're just being caught up in this because of people's religion just paranoia. So those are kind of like the frameworks that we kind of have to parse out when we're talking about witch narratives and witch hunt narratives in particular and also therefore like the more true it is that they are evil witches in league with the demons or with the, with the devil the less feminist the narrative is able to be because it's like well if you're if you are pricking me in the middle of the night and causing my cows to die and putting a blight on my cripe on my cripes, um, putting a blight on my crops, like the community is more justified in being like we don't really want you around, right? This book plays with the balance of the supernatural versus feminist lens, realist lens, very very well. Toward the end of the book, Rebecca has glimpses of the supernatural world in ways that are like easy for us as readers to sort of pin on her mental state. But then the book is very comfortable leaving sort of like that question mark in the air like we talked about and saying like maybe this is how she's experiencing the world because she's distressed, but maybe there really is a supernatural element going on. So. Socioeconomic pressures are in the background of the story. The story doesn't directly reference the war, but it does say that there is some war going on, that the men of their community are 
A lot of them are dead, a lot of them are still serving at the war, so we have a lot of widows, we have a lot of young unmarried women, or we have a lot of young married women whose husbands are away at the war. You have a lack of food, therefore you have a lack of charity. The needs of the community are heavier than what the infrastructure can provide, and this results in internal strife in the community. And you overlay that with like a very intense religious worldview, and thus you get the witch trials. So systematically, you see how the community persecutes the most vulnerable. Um, it's the people who are the most needy, they're the biggest strain on the community, and they're also the least able to defend themselves because they have the least amount of power. Another theme that's explored by this story is the way that um, religious paranoia and sexual desire are intertwined. So one of the very earliest scenes in the story is Rebecca and her friend play a game which involves sort of singeing a cabbage and you do that in order to see the face of who you're eventually going to get married to. So this is basically the 1600s version of MASH, right? But with this intense religious culture, Rebecca feels very guilty and uncomfortable with this. You know, it's very, for her, it's very akin to witchcraft. So she has a lot of internal guilt about it. She also has a lot of internal guilt about her own feelings of attraction that of course are very natural for a young woman to have of her at her age, but it, it just makes the, the religious circumstances in the puritanical culture, puritanical, purity, that's what they're all about, it, it means that there's not um, a framework for her to understand her own natural feelings in a way that isn't condemnatory, right? Also, um, later on in the story, we find we see that Matthew West, the witch finder, also finds um, Rebecca attractive, and his own sexual attraction is bound up both in her his perception of her corruption, so that's like purity culture elements, which I think we're kind of familiar with, is like oh, because she's attractive and she that is inspiring within me certain feelings, I put the blame and the responsibility for what is stirred up within me on her as though she's a temptress rather than I'm having feelings of lust, right? And, but it's also <laughs> the reason why he wants to save her. So it's also bound up in her redemption journey. So her redemption journey is bound up in his own sense of redemption for himself, and it's all intertwined with his own sexual desire, but also the religious paranoia. And then the third thing that we see kind of in this narrative dealing with religious paranoia and sexual desire are the witch marks. So witch marks were this idea that somewhere on the body of the guilty which you would find like a mole or an irregular mark or a blemish of some kind that would indicate that they were in fact a witch. The idea was is that it's this sort of supernatural teat that they allowed the devil to suck off of giving him like whatever life force. As a result like all of these female bodies would be laid bare a lot of them would be the old and infirm so it's not necessarily a sexual thing but it is a power thing. Matthew West kind of um, internalizes this thought. He's like, wow, I'm looking at all of these like naked female bodies and it's doing nothing for me, right? But so it's an interesting way of exploring this system of power, the religious paranoia, the sexual desire, the female body, um, et cetera, et cetera. So returning then to Rebecca's attractiveness, this is also very much intertwined in her story. She knows that what saves her is her attractiveness. So first thing that happens that puts her on a journey so that she could potentially save herself is that John Eads is the note taker for all of these trials as they're sort of kicking off. And when he's sort of sitting in the room and it becomes clear to him that both Rebecca West and her mother are about to be accused, he like runs from the meeting and tries to get to her to tell her to warn her ahead of time. Matthew Hopkins, as I previously mentioned, he wants to give her a way out. He basically wants to cut her a deal and it's obviously motivated by his attraction to her. And the way that this is sort of set up is that he's basically asking Rebecca to flip on her mother. So if she says, yes, I did, I participated in these things, but it was because my mother forced me to, she's the real witch, then her mo own mother gets fully condemned and hanged, but she gets to walk free by providing the evidence that helps condemn some of the witches. And when she takes that deal, ultimately, that saves her life, he 
gives her a position in his household as a servant because she admitted to being a witch. So nobody in the community is going to want to work with her. So he is able to isolate her, hire her, have power over her, redeem her, etc., etc. The systems in place, like you can see this character, she's like being moved as this po political turmoil is going on. And she basically, you know, like I said, she starts off with being this quite innocent young girl with a crush on a young man who's in her community playing the 1600s equivalent of MASH and then getting basically forced to the point where she is lying to the judge in order to save her own skin while also knowingly condemning her own mother to death even though she knows that they're both innocent and neither one of them are switches. And she realizes that she is being complicit in the system that ultimately, yes, she gets to live, but Matthew Hawkins is greatly enriched by this. He makes a ton of money. He becomes a wealthy man and it keeps the other men in power. And so she's like watching this all happen and she has very complicated feelings about her own identity, her, her spiritual position with regard to God, uh, her own sense of guilt, etc. And, and it's very, it's a very interesting story. So when you get under the hood of the behavior and you see what they are willing to do and why and the chaos of it all, it would lead you to see the devil like everywhere, or you would have to like completely deny all of it. And so, like I said, we see Rebecca starting out as this nice, normal girl, getting to the point where she's willing to lie to condemn her own mother to death, which would, of course, actually make her more aligned with the devil, according to her own worldview, right? And as she, as the novel gets further and further along, she becomes more and more convinced of her guilt, actually, that she is, in fact, in alignment with the forces of evil, and that she knew she wasn't a witch to begin with, but now she's being manipulated and forced into these circumstances where she is doing more and more evil things, so of course she would be more in alignment with the devil. While this is happening, the book very cleverly begins to slip in more and more overt descriptions of Matthew Hopkins as the devil, which is, he of course doesn't see himself as the devil. This is all sort of metaphorical. This is all behind the veil for Matthew himself. But the typical description of the devil in all of these sort of uh, narratives and witness statements and testimonies and things is a man in a black suit with a tall hat, which of course is how Matthew is dressed. And it ultimately culminates in him publishing his own book about everything that has happened. And the illustration on the front page is him in the background behind all of these women who have been accused as a man in a black suit with a tall black hat and just looking exactly like the devil, which Matthew himself is completely blind to. So I really enjoyed this book. I enjoy that this book asked the question, you know, who is the real devil here? I, I enjoy books that ask that, who's the monster, who's the monster within? And it really asks us to sort of like confront our own capacity for evil and confront our own capacity for um, being manipulated by systems. What are we vulnerable to? Um, even when we have good intentions in this world. Um, and if life really had a chokehold on you, um, what are the pressures that would cause you to do what you know to be wrong? And what would be the effects on the rest of your life as you processed it? We kind of end the story with Rebecca basically saying, well, I guess now I am kind of an agent of the devil because I was put in this position and I chose these things. And now I know that what I've done is evil and wrong. And so how would you process that, especially if you grew up in this very extremely religious environment? So anyway, all in all, beautifully written book, very thoughtful book, and I really enjoyed the questions it asked. Let me know what you think of witch hunt narratives, the way that they're used for exploring um, feminist stories, the way that they're ex used to explore the supernatural versus a very realist or naturalistic explanation of the world. I would love to know your thoughts in the comments down below. And until next time, my name is Alexandra and I am still a bibliophile. <laughs>